Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. Isn't it wonderful that night after night we can talk with each other about this wonderful book, the Bible, the Bible, that we can look into the Bible and uh, and uh, ask uh, what does this verse mean or what does that verse mean and and as we talk together we can find truth we can know what God is really teaching oh sometimes we can't sometimes uh, the Bible is so uh, complex and the meaning is still hidden and it hasn't been God's good pleasure to open our spiritual eyes to the truth that may be in that particular verse but again and again, as we diligently compare Scripture with Scripture, we do find uh, truth. And uh, whenever we find truth, we find that it is in harmony with everything else we have learned from the Bible that relates to the kingdom of God, that relates to this wonderful salvation plan that God has set forth in the, in the Bible. Now, we... I've received a letter from a listener in Hong Kong, Hong Kong, China, and uh, this listener is wondering, uh, can God really appear? How can we see him or hear him? Well, uh, if someone is looking to see God literally, they might be wide open to a visit by Satan. You know, Satan goes about as an angel of light. And he gives people visions in which they think they are seeing God in that vision, seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. And my, they're exhilarated. They've had a visit from God himself. That can not happen from God. The only place we're going to see God is in the Word of God. That is, as we read the Bible, God describes His many attributes, His integrity, His long-suffering, His patience, His kindness, His uh, mercy, His grace, uh, His wrath, all kinds of attributes of God. And so we, through uh, the Bible can see Jesus. No, we don't see him physically or literally. We see him through the words of the Bible as God describes various aspects of who God is. To hear him? Oh my, yes. Every time we read the Bible, it is, we're reading words that came right from the mouth of God. Holy men of God spoke as God the Holy Spirit moved them. And so whenever we're reading the Bible, we are hearing the voice of God. No, not a literal voice, but it, because these words came from the mouth of God, it is as if God is literally speaking to us. For that matter, as we read the Bible, we should hold the Bible in great respect. We should fear and tremble before the Word because God does not speak idly. He doesn't play games. He isn't just giving idle warnings of, of the penalty of sin and so on. These are all true and trustworthy, dependable statements that are telling us precisely what God intends to do. And He always carries out His commitments right to the very letter of the law because God is God. There is no limitation on his ability to do what he wishes to do. Well, thank you, Hong Kong. And may you, may you, as all of us, uh, see God in the word of God. May we uh, thrill that we can hold in one hand uh, this book, the Bible, and know that everything there is from the mouth of God. And then, at the same time, we should be praying that God will open our spiritual eyes so that we have some understanding of what God is teaching us and commanding us 
in the Bible. Well, thank you very much, Hong Kong. And shall we take our first caller now from our telephone lines? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Harold Camping. Yes. Um, I'm a third-time caller. Yes. Um, could you turn to John 6, verse 51 to 58? John 6, verse 51. Let's take a look. John 6, verse 51 to 58. There we read where Jesus is saying, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the whole world. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, that is truly, truly, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And the living as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now, what is your question? I don't get this passage at all. What's Jesus talking about right here? Well, what he's talking, first of all, you know, we have to remember how God wrote the Bible. Jesus said he spoke in parables, and without a parable he did not speak unto him, uh, uh, speak unto us. Now, here he is saying, I, this is Jesus' words, I am the bread of life. Now, when we look at the Lord Jesus, we know he was not a loaf of bread. We, we wonder uh, spiritually, what is he saying? Uh, and you see, God is using bread as a, as a figure of what we eat to have physical life. We have to eat bread or some, some, some other food similar to that in order to have physical life. Now, we have to receive our spiritual life all together from Christ. As we read the Bible and as we trust in Him, as God gives us that trust, we are eating Him as the bread of life. That is, we are receiving spiritual life. Now, you notice He says, you have to drink my blood. Now, it, of course, He doesn't, did not mean that literally, that's metaphorical. Uh, blood it has to do with life the life of the flesh is in the blood uh, the Bible says in another place uh, and so we have uh, uh, to drink Christ's blood means to receive life from him he's the only one who can give us eternal life and re 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 rescue us rescue us from that second death that we're subject to, namely hell, because of our sins. And so we eat his flesh because he's the bread of life. That is, we receive our life because he gave his life, and we drink his blood. That is, we receive eternal life uh, because he uh, gave his life for our sins. All right, I'm going to ask you two more questions. Number two is, let's just say I'm, I'm like 35 and I married this little woman and she divorced me. Is it appropriate to marry another girl, is it? 
It is, it is, the Bible teaches, if we're going to be faithful to the Word of God, that the wife is bound to her husband as, by the law, as long as he lives. And, uh, and likewise, therefore, the husband would be bound or shackled to the wife. All right, so there's a divorce. The wife, the husband divorces the wife, but from God's vantage point, he is still married to her. And uh, therefore, she cannot marry as long as he is living, and he cannot marry as long as he is living because he's already married to a wife. Of course, in our day, those laws of the Bible are, are paid no attention to. Uh, everyone knows better than God today, it seems. And so they simply uh, figure out ways where, well, I know I was married, yes, and I divorced, but for this reason or that reason or some other reason, there, I know that I can marry again. Well, all they have done is change the law of God to suit themselves by that action they are clearly declaring I'm not under the law of God I'm under my own law I'll do it what I want to do and that of course brings the wrath of God that's precisely what sin is when we go contrary to the law of God all right here's my third question could you turn to Mark chapter 8 verse 23 I'm sorry, what book? Could you turn to Mark chapter 8, verse 23? Mark chapter 8, verse 23. Let me take a look. Mark 8, verse 23. There we read, And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he looked at He asked him if he saw sight, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Is that the passage? Yes, and what, do you know why Jesus did that? Because that passage is kind of interesting. Well, the reason is that we learn from the Old Testament that to be spit upon is uh, to... Uh, indicating we're under the curse of God. We're under the curse of God. And uh, Jesus spit on this man's eyes to emphasize that spiritual point, it, uh, it, that he was under the curse of God, as every one of us is before we are saved. Uh, every human being, before they are saved, whether they like it or not, are under the curse of God because they are in rebellion against God. That's true of any one of us before we're saved. However, Christ came to save sinners, that is, those who are under the curse of God. And so here we see him opening this, the physical eyes of this man who is under the curse of God, and to, again, that is, we have to look at that uh, spiritually, Christ spoke in parables. That is, uh, this is a, a parabolic uh, action. As he opens the man's physical eyes, that's a dramatic picture how God opens our spiritual eyes. Christ is the one who became a curse for us so that we could have our spiritual eyes open that is so that we might have eternal life but before this happened God is uh, re reporting to us and letting us know for certain you were under the curse of God you are headed for eternal damnation have a blessed day Mr. Harold Camping thank Th you very much thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum Hello. Yes, good evening. Yes, uh, I had a, uh, a couple of questions. Yeah, excuse me, could you turn your radio off, please? please. Uh, my, my radio is off. Okay, we got a lot of noise on the line. Uh, I'm calling from a cell phone, that might be part of the problem. Well, let's, uh, we'll try, go ahead. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, I've been listening to your show over the past couple of weeks, and, and um, you know, I, I feel like I'm a very faithful person, but I've also become somewhat confused by some of the things that you you stated in your show, and one of them is that you uh, have said that. Um, God no longer exists in in the church. So does that mean then that we are essentially wasting our time by attending masses? Not only are you wasting your time, but you every time you attend a church, I don't care what the name of the church is, what denomination it is, it's it's every local church wherever it is found in the world whatever the denomination any time someone attends they're expecting to receive some kind of spiritual blessing in actuality is in a very dangerous place because God not only is not operating there any longer but worse than that he's also uh, sending us, the Bible says, a strong delusion on those who continue to go. In other words, they are becoming more and more blinded to the truth, and so it is. Uh, it is a. It is a uh, dangerous, dangerous place to be. That's why God commands us to come out. Now, wonderfully, outside of the congregation. God is still saving. There's a great salvation plan going on. But the authority is not any church or congregation. Now, the way the churches have basically operated uh, is that, uh, to a high degree, is that the church was the authority. For example, if you're a Roman Catholic, you are taught to trust what the Roman Catholics believe. Uh, and uh, you're never asked to test what they believe against the Bible uh, uh, to see whether they are faithful altogether to the Bible. And this, this is true in, in uh, every denomination. Everyone is taught to trust what that particular church believes, whether they're Baptist or Reformed or Roman Catholic or Seventh-day Adventist or whatever it is. And... God now is saying, no, no, you can't trust any church. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I, I am finished using congregations to bring the gospel, but you have to trust only the Bible, on, only the Bible. And there's no church that's going to stand in between. The authority is the Bible. That should have been the authority of every local congregation. In other words, what it should have been happening is throughout the church age is that every local congregation is testing its doctrines, its creeds repeatedly against the Word of God in, uh, to make sure that they are true and trustworthy and at the same time searching out more and more truth from the Bible. But gradually uh, the opposite happened. What uh, what the churches decided was truth became the ultimate authority, and and in fact they were even ready to make modification uh, to suit themselves without depending at all upon the word of God. Now, however, we have we're freed from all of that. We're not under that kind of bondage of having to listen to what the church believes. We just listen to what the Bible teaches. Now, for example, on this program, we teach what the Bible says, but we never ask anybody to say, look, trust what we teach. Don't deviate from what we teach here on Family Radio, even though we think that we're uh, as accurate as possible in the Word of God. Uh, we simply ask people, please, Listen to the Word of God. We will try to guide you into the Word, but you, your trust, has to be what you read in the Bible, not what you heard by a Bible teacher on family radio. But thank you for calling and sharing. And, and you know, if, 
You've just been listening a little while, and this is a, a shocker, a real shocker, that you have to come out of the church. And many people are dismayed at this. And then you have to start asking the question, why am I dismayed? Am I dismayed because maybe I'm going to lose my salvation if I come, uh, if I leave this church? Am I dismayed that I, I don't have an authority anymore? Well, that will betray the fact, yes, that's what has been your trust, is what the church teaches, but your trust is not in the Bible. You know, today, as we are commanded to leave the church, we are not commanded to abandon the Bible. We are not commanded to abandon the Bible. In fact, the opposite is true. We are commanded to listen more carefully, more carefully to the Bible and trust it alone and in its entirety. And that is a safe and secure place to be. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Acts 114. Acts 114. All right, let's look at that. This is uh, on the day of Pentecost. This is going on in Acts 114. And we read there that... Uh, 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 oh, no, this was just, just ahead of that. Let's, uh, let's see once. And when they, they were in the upper room, uh, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, and all the other apostles are named, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And it is this, uh, it is at this time that it's between the time that Christ went to heaven and, uh, or, or that he rose from the grave, actually, and the Holy Spirit was poured out for 40 days, the first 40 days, Christ would appear uh, uh, again and again to this group or to that group. And then the last 10 days or so, uh, he had gone back to heaven, and now they're the apostles and the uh, believing women uh, and others are are uh, biding together. They're they're meeting together, waiting for the promise that Christ had made, that when he went back to heaven, he would send the Comforter. That is, he would pour out the Holy Spirit. And that happened a few verses later, uh, in chapter two, uh, where uh, uh, that grand and wonderful event took place which uh, actually was the official beginning of the church age. Uh, <clears throat> my question is, was the uh, woman praying with the men? The Bible doesn't say. It just says they abode together, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, these were believers. They were waiting. They were waiting. They had trusted Christ, that uh, Christ had told them to wait because the Holy Spirit would be poured out and the Bible doesn't describe what who was saying what doesn't say that the woman were praying there it does not say that it simply says that it's these all praying. continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women yeah. a and the women I, I, I you know it doesn't mean that they were taking turns praying out loud it means that they had time uh, in fact, most prayer should not be out loud. It ought to be from my own heart because I want God to hear me. It doesn't mean everybody else has to hear what I'm praying. And so to uh, meet together and have a time of Bible study and prayer doesn't mean that one after the other has to take a turn praying out loud. So it doesn't say that then, that the woman were praying? It doesn't that. say that at all. Uh, but it, it, uh, certainly they were praying because they were true believers. And so maybe they, they were praying in their heart. But they, they would have been. Out they, uh, that's 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 the way every true believer normally prays. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. 
Hi, yes, I have a question on Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 22, okay, let's look at that. Which verse? Well, I know it's, it's a long chapter. Um, could you just explain the chapter to me? Uh, explain which? The chapter. The whole chapter? <laughs> well, maybe, uh, yes. <laughs> well, I... Uh, there, there, there are many, many rules here that thou, that God gives. Uh, he, many rules uh, of various kinds. There are laws that God gave uh, ancient Israel, and uh, and uh, many of them were ceremonial laws. We have to look at each sentence carefully to discover: is this part of God's moral law or God's ceremonial law? Now. For example, when it says in Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, if a man be found uh, with a woman married uh, to her husband, then uh, to an husband, then they shall both the, of them die, both the man and the woman, with the woman. Now that was an Old Testament moral law, but it was pointing, however, in this case, to the fact that those who live in sin are under the wrath of God. They are, are under, and it's indicating that adultery is a very grievous sin. Uh, it, there, there's a command here, for example, of uh, 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 you're not to put this in verse 9. Thou shalt not sow thy uh, vineyard with different seeds, lest the fruit of the seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of the vineyard be defiled now that is totally a ceremonial law in other words uh, just as there, the true believers are not to uh, to uh, uh, try to be like the unbelievers we are to be a separated people in our, our conduct and our action so in the Old Testament that was typified by the fact that you're not to have two kinds of seed in one field, or you're not to have two kinds of thread, uh, say, cotton and wool, in one garment. We must pause for this message. When we read the Bible, we know that ultimately everything is should pertain to the gospel. Now, the gospel... Uh, included in the gospel is, is that it shows us that we are sinners. And here in Deuteronomy 22, God gives a lot of areas where uh, sin can be seen. And we know from the Bible that there is the wrath of God, which was typified in the Old Testament by the, the death penalty that was placed upon certain actions. Uh, uh, later on in the New Testament, God did not insist on those laws anymore. He gave uh, he uh, gave uh, other laws that modified some of these laws. For example, the ceremonial laws like planting two kinds of seed in the field or two kinds of thread in the same garment uh, were completed in Christ, and we don't obey that anymore. They were a shadow uh, uh, that was pointing to the purity of the or of the true believer or the separation of the kingdom of God from the kingdom of the world laws concerning adultery and so on that brought the death penalty in the old testament uh, were became subject to the law of the land that was uh, that was that is the the penalty became subject to the law of the land although the laws themselves were repeated because in the New Testament, Christ said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, and so on. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, is 1-800-322-5347. Five three eight five one eight hundred three two two five three eight five. And shall we take our next call, please? 
Good evening, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Um, I have a question regarding Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1. Yeah, Proverbs 27, let's look at that. Proverbs 27, verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Well, you know, that's a very practical law right there. This is a well, law of God that we are not to, uh, we are not to uh, brag, tomorrow I'm going to win the game. Tomorrow I'm going to make a killing on the stock market. Tomorrow I'm going to uh, do this, or tomorrow I'm going to do that boasting uh, about uh, letting people know how great we are because... Uh, you don't know what that day is going to bring. Tomorrow might uh, uh, bring calamity into your life. But uh, spiritually, we have to find the gospel in this. And the fact is that there are those who are boasting. When I die, I'm going to heaven. When I die, I, uh, because I become a child of God, uh, uh, and they, and they don't even know that they are a child of God for sure at all. Uh, what uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens in the rest of this person's life. Is he truly going to become saved or not? And if he doesn't truly become saved, all of his boasting about how he is going to go to be with Christ and so on will never happen. Sir, um, you claim that through progressive revelation based solely on the Bible, that it is now the end of the church age and that in all likelihood Jesus will return in 2011. Does this claim of yours qualify as boasting about tomorrow? It has nothing to do with boasting. Nothing to do with boasting. It simply is a, a honest effort to uh, set forth what the Bible teaches. That is not boasting. I'm not. You're not hearing me boasting about what Family Radio is going to do, or boasting about what I'm going to do, or anything of that nature. Uh, I am simply declaring what I understand the Bible is teaching, and uh, and, I, and and incidentally, it's in a atmosphere where. Uh, in an environment of the open forum where uh, anybody can criticize if, if there's anything that is being taught that is contrary to the Word of God. Of course, they have to use the Bible uh, to show that it's contrary, and, and uh, that would be very thankfully received because our boast can only be in the Lord, not in ourselves at all. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I know you control this program and you have every right to interrupt me, but please allow me a moment to make my point and ask a question as I compare Scripture with Scripture. In Psalms chapter 34, verses 1 and 2, we read, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, we read, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. And in chapter 11, verse 10, we read, As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Now, these are only a few examples for how a child of God is to boast confidently about the gospel message. You've recently written two books with bold titles, The End of the Church Age and After, and Time Has an End, A Biblical History of the World, 11,013 B.C. to 2011 A.D., that deal with the end of the church age and how Jesus will most likely return in 2011. As the head of Family Radio, you've decided that it's imperative to spread this message to and for the elect in accordance with God's will. Why then are you now ashamed of admitting that you're boasting about what you understand is the gospel truth through progressive revelation? Well, I don't know what, you're, what point you are making. Uh, uh, boasting normally has to do with boasting about how great I am. Uh, the uh, 
uh, here in Second uh, Corinthians 11 and so on, the boasting is in Christ. We boast concerning the greatness of Christ, the glory of Christ. All the glory has to go to Christ. We simply walk very humbly, and, and if we're going to talk about anything great and superlative and wonderful, it'll be talking about how wonderful a Savior Christ is, how wonderful His salvation program is, how certain His truths are that they will be carried out. And you can call that boasting, but it's boasting in the Lord, not boasting in ourselves. Uh, that is where we have to make the distinction. Uh, in Proverbs 27, the implication is, is that we're boasting in ourselves. Okay, well, in the end of the church age and after, you wrote, the true meaning of these end time statements is not to be revealed to the, to the minds of men until near the time of the end. Thus, we can expect in our day, when the signs are showing that we must be close to the end of time, the meaning of a great many biblical passages should become revealed to the minds of careful, diligent students of the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that you're saying that I'm a, a great person, but you are boasting about the role that you're playing and the message that you're giving now. Well, excuse me. There, there's no boasting there. It is simply making a declaration that the Bible says, seal this book in Daniel 12 until the time of the end. And so we can expect that if we're near the time of the end, that God is going to reveal truth to us. And it's not only to me, it's in, into uh, thousands of other people as they check out the scriptures and they find the same truths there. That has nothing to do with personal boasting. Uh, it, it, it is, in fact, it's just the opposite. It makes us want to be more and more humble before the Lord. How in the world is it possible that God has revealed this to me? I still remember, let me get, speak very personally about this. I still remember 44 years ago, uh, I had been working in the Bible very diligently for several years. And this was right uh, about two or three years after Family Radio began and uh, and we had just begun the open forum program there about two years and it had been on the air about two years and about that time I finally uh, the Lord opened my spiritual eyes so that I was able to to know the uh, the time of creation that it was 11,013 BC and I had very very carefully worked this through the Bible backwards and forwards and checked it every way that I could possibly check it to make sure that it was uh, right on. And I remember the strange feeling I had at the time. What in the world is going on? Who am I? I'm a nothing. I'm a nothing. I, I'm, I, I have no standing at all in the world as a theologian or as a Bible teacher, uh, and yet somehow I, I here here I have worked through the Bible and I see uh, that creation is 11,013 and it was a humbling experience not a boastful experience it was a humbling experience what is going on and the only thing that sustained me at the time was I recognized God has always done that through the nothings you, we look at Peter James and John they were fishermen they were nothing in this world. We only we have uh, the prophets. Uh, you have Amos. He was a a, uh, a dresser of sycamore trees. We look at Elisha. He was a farmer. Uh, God used the nothings of the world, uh, as He speaks in First Corinthians. He uses the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise of the world, and our uh, words to that effect. And uh, in fact. There are only two really exceptions to this rule. One was Moses. He was very learned, the Bible says, in all the skill of Egypt. And, uh, and he was an exceedingly learned man. And there was the Apostle Paul, who had been trained as a Pharisee in the school of Gamaliel and so on. But outside of that, as we go through the Bible, David, for example, was a farmer boy. He was a he fed sheep. Uh, Saul, the first king, uh, was a farmer boy, uh, and uh, and all through the Bible, that's the way it has worked. 
and that God is still working today. We don't find the great theologians and those who have the big names and, and the big uh, uh, pedigrees of one kind or another that they are the ones that, are, that God is opening their spiritual eyes and ears to. We find it's just ordinary common people, just ordinary people that, that, uh, that uh, just humbly wait upon the Lord. But now, when our spiritual eyes are opened, and then we indicate what we have learned, that's not boasting. We're not going around saying, hey, look how great I am. Look what I have done. I can tell you, I, uh, you, you really have struck a very interesting question. In my role as host of the Pro Open Forum, as president of Family Radio, uh, I, I, my, I could, I could cover myself with a grandissement and walk around with my nose high in the air and, and get all kinds of plaudits coming my way in one way or another. And yet, anything like that it is abhorrent to me. It's abhorrent to me. All I want to do is just live as a humble servant of God. But when He teaches, when I learn something from the Bible. I have no I have no alternative. I must declare it. I must declare it. I can't take any credit because I happen to be able to uh, have the open forum program. I can't take any credit for my health so that I've been able to continue on this program for 44 years. I, I it's it's God has placed me here and so uh, every day I have to pray, "Oh Lord, help me to walk humbly before thee." because I know that I am nothing it is to be, it is Christ just like John the Baptist you know said it I must decrease and he that is Christ must increase and that's the way it should be with every true believer so you uh, you can you the, your perception may be of boasting but I'll tell you it's a long long ways away from truth and if there is any boasting my my I'm sure I'm sure uh, going to be asking God for forgiveness because there's no way that I want to boast of myself. Sir, if, if you're confident that this is the end of the church age and that Jesus will most likely return in 2011 and you have received this message through progressive revelation, then why are you ashamed of boasting about this message? Now, the example in Paul's Excuse me, to excuse the... me. Now, let's... Uh, you 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 may want me to boast but I don't want to boast and please I want to follow the scripture I don't want to follow your injunction you want me to boast and and then you have something to really uh, criticize and, well, and, but I, I, excuse me I'm not about to start boasting all I can say is I don't know why but God has opened this this truth and and in the, it's the task of a pro, of a of a believer, because we have a prophetic office. This is true of every believer. It is our task to try to share it with others. And thank you so much for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I know you have studied the Bible and have a very deep knowledge of it. And I was wondering if you could answer a question yes. that has been troubling me for some time. Do we know how old Isaac was when Abraham offered him up for a sacrifice? We do not know. He was a young lad. He uh, could have been six years old or, or 15 years old or something in between. He was a child, but we do not know how old. Okay. Because I know some people have said that he was like a 18 or 20 year old man. We have no, and a lot of people said he was just a little boy. So we have no anyone that is going to say that they think how old he is 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 pure speculation. There's no way you can trace it back then. No. Okay. So we'll just have to go that. It's not important whether he was six years old or 16 years old. The fact is, he was the son of Abraham, and there are two things that are going on here. First of all, we see the enormous faithfulness of Abraham, that he's willing to, uh, to, uh, to uh, kill his son as a sacrifice. Right. And secondly, we see the enormous trust 
in of Isaac that he's going along with this, that he's not trying to run away when daddy's going to bind him and lay him on the altar. There's no evidence of any rebellion on Isaac's part. So uh, it, is, uh, it is a profound and, uh, and wonderful example of two people, a child and an adult, who just implicitly trust God somehow. And, and once God realized that, then that was uh, kind of Abraham's final test. Well, that was the big test that so God gave test, Abraham, yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for clearing that up for me, sir. Th thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. First time, listener, um, you had made a comment earlier in this broadcast, a letter from a uh, lady in Hong Kong. Yes. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Um, but uh, she had asked about Christ appearing. She said, how could we make Christ appear? Yes. Or how could we uh, hear him? And uh, well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for pointing her to the direction back to looking for Christ in the scriptures. I want to commend you for that. Um, but the question I had was in Acts, uh, first of all, after the ascension of Christ, is Pete is a uh, Paul, or at that time Saul, and Christ appeared to him at the throne. And secondly, was Stephen when Saul, before Saul was converted, um, he stoned, or he uh, is there when Stephen is stoned, and Stephen looks into heaven and he sees Christ. Well, and, yes. Um, excuse I me. I guess uh, excuse, one. I, excuse me, but you see that uh, you have to keep this in mind, as the Bible was written. God did put in his appearance from time to time. Here's the Lord Jesus. He never ceased to be God. And he was on this earth almost 40 years. And so all kinds of people saw him. And even though they didn't recognize him as the Son of God, he was the Son of God. Now, he had emptied himself completely of his glory, and so he did not have the glory of God. But nevertheless, they were looking at God. And from time to time, uh, there were times when God himself uh, appeared. Like, for example, he came to Abraham and announced that Sarah was going to bear a son next year and that Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed. Uh, God took on the appearance of a man in order to personally convey that information to Abraham. Now, all of that was possible until... Revelation was written, the last book of the Bible. Once that was written, and God says, Now, you're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this book. You're not to take away from the words of the prophecy of this book. From that point on, God would never, never again put in an appearance of any kind. If we want to see God, we're going to see him on the pages of the Bible, and that's the only place. Okay, um... One other question was uh, you, your comments on uh, the church the church age being over. Um, you've probably explained this uh, many times before, but again, I said as a first time caller, was just the question of um, Christ's statement that the gates of hell shall not prevail against this church. And um, how does that fit what in with see. what you're saying there about it? Well, um, excuse the end me, of the you, age? excuse me. You see, the problem is that a great many theologians and Bible teachers and, and, and Christians, quote-unquote, look at that, and they say, oh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, uh, that, and they immediately think of the local congregation, that that is the church. They fail to realize that the gates of hell does prevail against the local congregation, against everyone in that congregation that is not saved. And no local congregation is 100% made up of believers. It is, uh, we find, for example, already in that day, if you read Genesis, uh, Revelation chapter uh, 3, or uh, that the church of Sardis was already at that time a dead church with only a few believers in it. So that meant that the gates of hell was uh, was at the foot of, of virtually everybody in that congregation except those few believers. Now those few believers, they were citizens of the eternal church. 
And when we're citizens of the eternal church, no, the gates of hell, that is, hell has no claim on us. Our sins have all been paid for. And, and that eternal church is still being built today. Everyone that becomes a believer today is joining the church. That is, God is bringing them into the eternal church. But the external, the, the local congregations, that's an entirely different matter. That, uh, that has no security whatsoever. And that's why as the true believers are driven out or commanded to come out, what is left? Just the unsaved more and more. And so uh, uh, the, the, uh, it no longer has any, there's no, not even individuals in it any longer who have any, uh, any uh, uh, security insofar as eternal damnation is concerned. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Counting? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to kind of contribute to the discussion that is going on about your book. Um, I've read through it, and I realize that you've done a pretty, a pretty good job in trying to explain uh, what you're trying to uh, are you talking bring about, out. Are you talking about the book, Time Has an End? Yes. Okay. Now, you know, uh, you know spiritual truth uh, requires uh, a supernatural witness because it's a spiritual truth. We're not talking of um, just a little bit of history. So uh, after reading through, I think... And listening to those who are calling in on it, uh, asking the wrong questions. And I think as believers, uh, we should be able to think when we read anything, especially as profound as that. Uh, the, I think the right question that came to my mind is, what is truth? Because I, I understand somebody had a prediction for 1994 also, and um, it didn't come true. So a lot of people are probably confused, too, and they are showing it. So the, the, the true question for me and for others to ask is, what is truth? And the answer is, truth um, is Jesus. Truth is the Scripture. Truth is the Holy Spirit. Now, if one reads um, John chapter 14, verse 1 and 2 and 14, it said, In the beginning the Word was with, the, uh, the word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, to test any material, uh, whether it's truthful or not, a believer, I'm talking to the believers now, must use these three criteria. Is the truth, is that material uh, telling the truth about Jesus? Is that material scriptural? And is that material... Um, being taught with the person reading it by the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, what that means is Jesus is revealed by the Scripture as the truth. And the Scripture reveals that Holy Spirit is the truth also. So when you put those three criteria of John chapter 1, Verse 1 and 2 and 14, you can see that Jesus Christ was the truth. Also, you could see that the scripture revealed Jesus Christ too. Now, what is your so, point now? Well, excuse me. Now. My point is, is, is this that when you, you, everybody must test this, and before criticizing or even saying no or not, they must test it that. Whatever you've written, does it glorify Christ? Is it scriptural? 
and it's, uh, does, your, does the Holy Spirit inside us magnifies what you are reading and reveals something to you that you've never known before. And if you read before, I'll, I'll, I'll quit and just um, allow you to read uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 to 27. And that scripture is very, very good, and it doesn't need any interpretation. But if anybody reads that, they'll be able to make their own decision. But just trying to accept what somebody read without a test of those yeah. three criteria is very wrong. All right, hold, excuse me, excuse read. me. We're going to have to pause for this message. We have a caller on the line that's making a point, as I understand his uh, statement, namely that the only truth is in Christ, and he is absolutely correct. The only truth is Christ. The very essence of Christ is truth. His name is truth. Uh, and and so we... Uh, we uh, there, no one can can argue with that with that fact what is making uh, difficult or maybe this is uh, should be clarified god has provided for teachers we read in the book of ezra or the book of nehemiah i forget which one it is right off hand where uh, where uh, uh, the word of god was read to the congregation in, in that day and then there were others who uh, gave the sense of what was read. In other words, they were teachers. Now, what the teachers say, that is not inspired by God. No teacher can say the words that flow from my mouth outside of the, when I am quoting from the Bible itself are inspired by God. But they are ordained by God or commanded by God to do their best to teach. And they have to teach in a faithful way to the Word of God. Now, isn't it, uh, keep this in mind, for example, when you read Time as an End, that book, or the book, The End of the Church Age and After, uh, what is being quoted? Are, are different theologians being quoted that Calvin said this and Luther said that and, and uh, someone else said something else? No, the quotations all come from the Bible because the Bible is the authority. Everything leans back on the authority of the Bible. Those Bible quotations, of course, are inspired by God. They are absolutely true. The explanation can be in error, uh, and that's uh, and that's the role of the teacher to try to be as faithful as possible. And I can tell you, any legitimate teacher of the Bible is going to be praying all the, all the time. Oh Lord, help me to be as faithful as possible. But the purpose of, of a teacher is to, re to direct people into the Word of God. Uh, don't trust me. You have to trust the Word of God. But I want you to look at these verses because they uh, appear to say thus and th so and, and, and this and that and, and so on. And if you see the same thing I see in it, you can see where it leads us to that we arrive at this conclusion or that conclusion and uh, and that is the methodology that God has established and uh, but never never do we want to come into a position where we say I have the truth you listen to me you just obey what I say ah uh, now now we have a substitution of my authority for the Bible's authority. That can never be. All, all a teacher can say is, the Bible is the authority. The Bible is the authority. The Bible is the authority. I will help you to, uh, to uh, uh, see how God puts the Bible together, and then you check it out and, and see, uh, see uh, if, if this is true or not. And that's one of the reasons, and I say this repeatedly, repeatedly, one of the best blessings in my life is the open forum where I'm in the marketplace as a teacher and anybody can object to what is I am teaching but they have to object from the Word of God and, and, uh, and, and, and if they are correct in their objection uh, uh, then I can tell you honestly, honestly, this is not paying lip service to anything 
honestly, I am delighted to be corrected, not because I am delighted to be wrong, but delighted to know that now I will be more accurate in the Word of God. And because even a teacher has to be corrected. In fact, he's the first one that should be corrected uh, when uh, something is being taught that is not as accurate as it should be. But thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I have a question. Um, I don't have my Bible handy, but maybe you can help me out here. question I have, actually I have two. The question, first question is, when Samuel died and Saul was inquiring of Samuel, yes. that apparition that Saul had seen, what was that apparition from? Was that of Saul, or was he as with Christ and he could not come back from the dead? Well, it obviously was not Samuel, because... Uh, uh, that uh, Saul was asking to speak to Samuel, and here comes this apparition, which incidentally Saul did not see, the woman saw it, uh, and, uh, and it, it sounded like the voice of Samuel, but actually it had to be an apparition from God, or, or rather for, from Satan, and, uh, and uh, Satan uh, made some very accurate statements there, but he also made a couple of statements that were not true uh, because it is from Satan. But uh, uh, they brought up Samuel. Wait a minute. Samuel is not down there. Samuel is up there in heaven. And so if it had been from God, it would have said that they brought Samuel down from heaven. Uh, but he, uh, he, what this apparition came out of the earth. It was, uh, it was not Samuel at all. But thank so you. the apparition that was seen with Christ when they saw Moses, I'm confused about that. Uh, you're confused about which? Uh, I don't know where in the Bible it is, but um, a couple of the apostles were with Jesus, and they had seen Moses, and I believe Elijah, with, with Jesus. Yes, that was not an apparition. That was an actual, literal thing that did happen that Christ was glorified before the eyes of Peter, James, and John, and he actually had conversation with two men who are in heaven in their, not only in their soul existence, but also in their bodies, and they came to speak to Christ about his coming death. The Bible says that, and, uh, and that, was not a, that was not an apparition. That was an actual, literal a happening that did happen. Burn it up. Thank you for calling and sharing. And you can read about that about Matthew 17, uh, 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 either that chapter or the next chapter. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Got a cap? Yes. Yes, go ahead yes. with your call. Hello? Yes. Yes, I was wondering, uh, I, after studying uh, church history and the first 15 centuries, um, you were talking about being corrected. I'm wondering why I don't read anybody teaching from Scripture, teaching their interpretation of Scripture in the church, why they don't teach what you're teaching as far as the Bible alone is God's sole authority. I mean, I don't see that until the 16th century. Well, that's because we don't have adequate records, but there were men uh, that were teaching already in uh, uh, 100 to 200 A.D. or 80, 100 to 200 that uh, we don't know very much about. But what we do know about, uh, some of these men were quite faithful to the Word of God, although they, uh, remember, we're living in a very unusual time. Uh, I quoted earlier Daniel 12 that uh, the, where God gave the man Daniel uh, that lived about um, 600 years before Christ, and God gave him a lot of information about the end of the world, and then he said, seal it up. It is to be revealed. In other words, it's going to be revealed at the end. And we're living at the end. We're very close to the end. So this is the time when God is opening our spiritual eyes to a lot of things 
that former theologians did not understand at all. Our understanding of the Bible today should be immensely greater than that of, of any other time uh, in the history of the church uh, during the Reformation or any other time. We should, be, we should have a far greater understanding. Fact is, uh, uh, when I wrote the book Time as an End, and as I reflect on that, virtually everything that is taught in that book, and it, and I, uh, everything I've tried to bring everything right out of the scriptures, but almost nothing in that has ever been taught in a seminary anywhere. Now that's because uh, that isn't because that I'm smarter than somebody else or wiser or anything, but I happen to live in a different time. I happen to be living at this time when God is opening our the spiritual ears and eyes of true believers to things that he has never, never uh, declared into uh, prior generations. You know what? I, I think that I think that that is ludicrous and that you are of Satan. Well, you can think what you wish, and that doesn't surprise me. The, the scribes thought they accused Jesus of being Satan, and, and Christ said, well, if they accuse the master, they're going to accuse the servant. So I'm not surprised at all that you would say that. And from your vantage point, from your understanding of the Scripture, uh, 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 yes, you, you have a, probably an entirely different understanding, and so I'm on, on the other side. Well, the only other side is Satan. But the, the big question is, uh, where is truth? Where is truth? And that is why we have to go again and again to the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, uh, Mr. Campy. I, I just wanted to kind of share a perspective. Um, I often, uh, in listening to, um, you know, the open forum, I hear people call in and ask questions related to things like, um, you know, how do I know uh, that I'm um, saved? How do I know that I'm born again? That sort of thing. And um, oftentimes when I hear that, I think to myself, well, you know, as as one of uh, you know God's elect, is is that what I'm ultimately concerned about? You know that I'm saved or something. Uh, now that that's in reference to myself, of course I'm terribly concerned about other people. Um, you know, in sharing the gospel. But um, I'd like to comment on this. Uh, I don't. I, I'm driving in my car right now, so I don't have my Bible in front of me. But I know towards the end of Ecclesiastes. Um, you know, after it's been saying vanity of vanities, all is vanity, it says, you know, and the end of the matter is this, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And I have found myself oftentimes in, in uh, witnessing or, uh, you know, sharing the gospel that uh, that sort of thing uh, comes up. And, um, you know, I find myself often responding by saying, well, you know, whether or not uh, you are one of God's elect, the command is still the same. Fear God and keep his commands. Now, of course, one of his commands is, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the real purpose that God has, uh, you know, created me as a new creature is to carry out his will, to glorify him, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, I can do nothing on my own to glorify him, but he threw me through what he does with me in my life as a manifestation of his work in my life uh, will bring glory to himself. And and I often think in those terms, you know, when, when I hear that, I, I'd like to say, say to somebody who is concerned about that, and there was a point in my life where I was very concerned about that, where I thought, well, I really, you know, gee, how do I know for sure that I'm saved? And of course, I came across passages such as in Hebrews, you know, where faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And, uh, you know, over time, I've, I've come to be more focused on what I had just described in that, no, you know, that's not the issue. Well, the well, issue is fear God and keep his commands. for that. Well, yeah, ex excuse me. Now, we have to be careful, you see, that because God has set traps in the Bible. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 15, where God says, uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, rather, let me turn to that a moment, God says this, 
And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Now that's approximately what you have just been indicated. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field, and so on. All right, now ancient Israel read that, and they said, Oh, our job then is to keep the commandments. And, uh, and now let's, let's look at the consequence of this. Let's, let's, let's look at the consequence of this. God uh, uh, reports, gives us a report card as to what happened to ancient Israel as they tried to keep the commandments as faithfully as they possibly could. We read in Romans chapter 9, uh, uh, but Israel, talking about the same Israel that Deuteronomy is speaking to, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, that is, they earnestly desired righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. In other words, they said, we will keep the commandments. We're go rigorously, religiously, we're going to keep the commandments. We're going to to put it in our day, we're going to believe in Christ. We're going to, uh, to trust Him, and we're going to do His will. The problem is they were trusting in what they were doing. They failed to realize that as they read all the commandments of the Bible, that they were spiritually dead and that, uh, that, uh, uh, that they were on their way to hell, and they... And any sin at all was sufficient to send them to eternal damnation. In other words, we could say it another way. Nobody can keep the commandments good enough or become good enough so that we are, are safe in Christ by keeping the commandments. Nobody can be good enough to do that. We desperately need a Savior. Now, in the Old Testament, God put alongside these commands, of these commands, you must obey my commands. But he also put alongside of that the, uh, the uh, admonition of burnt offerings and blood sacrifices. Why? What did that all have to do with? Well, it was to point them to the fact that there was a Messiah coming who had to be a burnt offering to make payment for their sins. And even in Ezekiel chapter 36, yeah, God spelled it out even more, more clearly. And this was also to ancient Israel in the first instance. He said in Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, uh, he, he declared, I will sprinkle clean water. I'm reading verse 25 of Ezekiel 36. I will sprinkle, uh, or excuse me, I'll, let me back up. Uh, I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of the nation. And the heathen shall know that I am Jehovah, saith Jehovah God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take ye from among the heathen, and gather you out of the countries, and will bring you into your own land. Uh, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean." From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I desire you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and so on. And in other words, God is showing us that we can keep the commandments as best we can, and we're still in deep trouble. God has to do all the work. We need a Savior to pay for our sins, because no matter how hard or diligently we try keeping the commandments, uh, we can't be perfect enough. We never can become good enough. And that's why it says in Romans 9, they did not trust in God as their Savior. They were trusting in the fact that they were keeping the commandments. Now, that's, that, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is something that people 
uh, cannot understand until God opens our spiritual ears and eyes and and we begin to see how how great a sinner we really are and how heinous sin is how terrible sin is and how the fact is that that sin has to be paid for and only Christ can pay for it and so we get right back to the point uh, that we must be born again and only God can make us born again only God can give us a brand new resurrected soul well, you know that is that is. I totally, 100% agree with that. I, I support uh, everything that you have said in that, and I accept that admonition um, uh, wholeheartedly. Because yes, we do need to be careful. I, I very much agree with that. And in addition to that, it reminds me of things like uh, fixing the, the passage, uh, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Yeah. That everything that that we do or say, um, in, in terms of the work that that, that we are carrying out um, in spreading the gospel, has to be pointed to the person of Jesus Christ, to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets and, all the glory. He gets and all he gets the glory. All the glory. And if if uh, uh, you know, my my one thing that I was trying to share was that um, yes. Given your, your your warning, which is well taken, and I would say the same thing as you, um, there is a part of it where I've seen people become overly concerned about, am I saved or not? Yes, we need to examine ourselves, you know, uh, to see if we are of the faith, et cetera, et cetera, all those passages, and that's definitely, uh, a, you know, a, a, a stern warning. Um, and also along with that, realizing, I guess this is another to maybe share what I'm trying to share is realizing that regardless whether you are saved or not, God creates us for His own purpose. Well, yes, and except that, it, except in fairness to the subject, when you say uh, it's a possibility of being over concerned whether I'm saved or not, I'll tell you that is a super, super, super question. It's, we, we're not going to sit back and say, well, even the wrath of man praises God, as the Bible indicates, and therefore if I should go to hell, uh, uh, so be it. Uh, that's me going to hell. That's not somebody else. That's me going to hell. And I'm deeply concerned about that. I really am, uh, would be, uh, anybody should be enormously concerned. Am I really a child of God? Can I know? And, of course, God gives us the criteria, as, we, uh, as he talks about, if we say we know him, we will keep his commandments, and or that we will delight in the word of God, and, and uh, so on, and we are, will be broken before God and walking humbly, and so on. But the idea of, uh, of uh, whether I am saved or not, we can never downplay that. That is the big, big, big issue that ought to be festering in every human's life until uh, they uh, uh, begin to sense in their life a real ongoing earnest desire to do the will of God that is their happiest when they are, are, are doing the will of God and it's consistent day by day situation with them because if we're not saved uh, and you know the wonderful thing is it's still the day of salvation and it's legitimate beyond measure to to wonder am I uh, to ask that question I wonder if I'm really saved and and we never want to discourage that okay but, well I, I uh, appreciate very much your comments and uh, I uh, I thank you for that thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum Yes, good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Brother Campy? Yes. Hi. Okay, uh, it's only um, two questions. I believe that God created the uh, earth, the whole world. Uh, I'm sorry. Could now, you turn, excuse would me, to... would you turn your radio off, please? We're getting feedback. Please turn your radio off and go ahead with your uh, statement. Okay. Um, the... Because I'm wondering, who created God? Well, that's a, a legitimate question. The Bible answers that. 
He is not created. He is from everlasting past. We, uh, he is outside of time. Our God is an infinite being that we don't understand at all. Uh, and yet he is so great, so great, that in the space of six days of 24 hours, he created this immense universe, as complex and complicated as it is, and he's coming again in a few years, and all of this is going to be destroyed, and he's going to recreate it, a new heaven and a new earth, and he's going to uh, proceed with eternity future. And these are things we don't understand at all. It's way beyond our little human minds to really understand. But we, we know that, that but the Bible simply says of God that he is from everlasting to everlasting that is he is he has no he was never created and we don't understand that we have no way of explaining that our little minds were not created to understand such a majestic and infinite god but let's take our last call please good evening welcome to open forum good evening welcome to open yeah. forum yeah, yeah. Good evening, Mr. Uh, Mr. Camping. I, I have something to say, and uh, I have a comment to make, and I want to be respected. Uh, I don't want to be cut off from the air. Also, uh, I will have a question for you. First, I want to say, Mr. Camping, uh, you must respect the people that call your show. Please don't cut them off, and let them let them speak. You always go, excuse, me, excuse me, excuse me, to cut them off, and that's not right. You know, you got to use Christian manners. Uh, they are not children. They they have the same right you do to to, to their opinion. Uh, now excuse me, I'm going to interrupt you. This program is not just to let someone air his views and go on and on and on and on. The purpose of this program, we do have a purpose, and that is this is a teaching program. We want to teach what the Word of God is indicating. Now, unfortunately, someone has to monitor it as to when uh, when we should interrupt or when we should get back on the track or whatever, and that happens to be the role of the host, and unfortunately, it's me. I don't always make right calls, I admit, but if from time to time I have to make a call. When I see that the discussion is not going anywhere, we're not learning from the Word of God, it's time to interrupt, and so I try to do it as carefully as possible. You, many times uh, a caller can go on for some time before I interrupt if necessary. So now, 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 what is your point? You've got a few seconds left to make it. Oh, we've lost our caller. Okay, the time has come anyway for the end of the program. My, my. Well, we've had a lot of opinions tonight, and uh, that's okay. Uh, and the Lord willing, we'll be back again uh, next Monday evening for another edition of the Open Forum. And until then, may the Lord richly bless you. And don't hesitate to keep reading the Bible.